It is March 4th, 2014. Um, is there anyone who would like to volunteer to start out asking our Heavenly Family to be with us? I'll pray. Thank you. Our Heavenly Family, we just thank you for this new moon day. We thank you for the opportunity to fellowship together on the WebEx line. Amen. And we thank you for all the blessings that we have received from this message. We ask your guidance and your blessing for Brother Trent and every one of the branch candidates. And we pray that you'll be with us now as we study thy word. For we ask it in the precious name of the branch, both he and she. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Heavenly Family. All right, so what I should try to do here uh, quickly, I didn't have time to do this ahead of time, so I'm going to try and do it now. I want to get a uh, picture of Psalm 5 up here on the screen for everyone so that... Uh, you know, you'll be able to see this translation of it. So, one second here. Uh, let me know when you guys can see uh, the chapter on the screen. Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right, so it's Psalm 5, and I, I just want to mention quickly in regards to this as well, the way that this psalm and the last one and the others in the future, and you know, as we go through studying these psalms, the way that these translations are coming about is, it's not, uh, it's not, this is not a translation that you can, uh, you know, it's not already a completed translation that you can get somewhere. Uh, I think Walter sent me a text about that, wondering if it's a translation online somewhere. And it isn't. Um, what it is, is a translation that I did by comparing the uh, Masoretic text with the Septuagint and variations in uh, textual notes that are part of the Mesora, which is... Again, that's the, the notes that the Mesorites did when they were putting together the Mesoritic text. And so they listed textual variants and, you know, what it says in other texts, other uh, manuscripts in the Mesoritic family or in other families of texts or in Syriac, ancient, uh, ancient Syriac versions and the rest of that. And that, if anyone wants to see those notes, they can pick up a... Uh, what's called a uh, either Masora, or you can get the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, which is you know the classic Hebrew Torah that you'd get for you know a critical text. So that's that's where that's coming from, and also um, it wasn't uh, the other thing that's been included in this to inform the translation is the Dead Sea Scrolls. There is no Dead Sea Scroll for Psalm 4 and for most of Psalm 5 because it's fragmentary. But there's there are sections in Psalm 5, but it wasn't really that different uh, from what you'd find in the Septuagint or the Masoretic text. So that's how this is coming about. And it's not, I want to let you guys know too that I'm not starting with the Masoretic text and then putting variations. The whole thing is coming about by uh, all the different texts working together to form the whole picture. So most most texts or most translations will just have one base text and just go with that. And some of the better translations will have one base text and then note differences in some other texts where this is kind of a uh, conglomeration of all the texts together. Um, I do want to mention two uh, with this translation, that almost everything in it is 
not going to be controversial in terms of the way it was translated. The only things that are really going to be different that people might dispute is translating Elohim as gods and Eloah as goddess. Other than that, I'm not aware of anything that would be uh, really disputed by anyone as being an accurate translation. Um, and the only other thing that's different is sometimes, for one word, you'll see I'll put, you know, a slash so that you can see other possible translations or other things that add to the meaning of what it is saying uh, that it could have been translated as. But together, it gives us a more full understanding. So that said, uh, we'll read the psalm. Um, I'll have Teresa read the chapter here to start with, and you guys can follow along. And for those of you who are calling in on the phone, I know that, um, yeah, you'll, you can follow along with your Bible and you'll just see some of the differences. But it looks like almost everyone is on the, uh, computer this time. So glad you guys are able to be on here and see it. All right. Psalm 5. For the end concerning her that inherits, a psalm of David. Septuagint intro. Listen to my words, Yahweh. Consider my sighing, groaning cry. Pay attention to the sound of my cry for help, my king and my goddess. I am interceding, or I intercede to you. Yahweh, in the morning you will hear my voice. In the morning I will go up before you and look upon you. For you are not a god, El, who delights in wickedness. You do not dwell with evil. The ones boasting shall not station themselves before your eyes. You hate, shun, all doers of uselessness, lawlessness. You will destroy all who speak falsehood. Yahweh is repulsed by the man of blood and deceit. But as for me, in the multitude of your mercy, I will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in fear of you. Yahweh, lead me in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make straight before me your way. For in their mouth there is no truth or firmness. Their inward part, inner self, is futile, injurious. Their throat is an open grave. Their tongue is a smooth, slippery slope. Judge them, Elohim. Let them fall by their own counsel plan. Drive them away because of their many transgressions, for they rebelled against you. And all those who take refuge in you will rejoice. Forever they will shout for joy, and you will dwell among them, and all who love your name will exult in you. For you bless the righteous, Yahweh, as a shield of approval, favor, you crown us. All right. So uh, just as we did last time, we're going to go through this piece by piece again. And by the end, we'll have a far greater understanding of it than we do right now at the beginning. So first off, just like last time, this is a psalm for the end. And last time we saw that it certainly does apply, you know, last time as in when we were studying Psalms 4, that it is a prophetic psalm applying to these last days. And I'm sure there are a number of uh, things that you may have already noticed as to each of the readings that parallel uh, what we read in Psalm 4 or a few similar uh, ideas. And also perhaps you notice some things paralleling Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 as we've gone through in the past. 
Um, so in the Septuagint, uh, for this psalm and a number of them, it starts off by saying, for the end, or these things concern the end. It is for the end. And it is, uh, that is something that you often don't see in the Masoretic text, even though the Hebrew that is in the Masoretic text could be read that way if you read it with different pointing. So obviously in the ancient world, they read it uh, in a way that meant for the end, and the Septuagint, or a Hebrew text that was very much the same as the Septuagint, is what the uh, apostles and Christ himself had and read. <clears throat> so, this is another psalm. It's for the end, and it's a psalm of David. So any psalms that we have that are psalms of David that are for the end are going to be messages that the antitypical David will give concerning different things, but it's all in relation to the end. This particular psalm is concerning her that inherits. So we should ask, okay, who is her that inherits? You know, or the inheritress is, you know, another way to translate it. It's uh, one who inherits, but it's feminine, you know. <clears throat> and this we could approach from a, a number of different ways, but we're just going, as we go through the chapter, it will become more clear as to uh, who this is referring to. But before we even get into the rest of the chapter, we can look elsewhere in the scriptures to find out who it is that inherits in the last days. Um, first, I'll just ask, does anyone know who her that inherits is? Does anyone know? <laughs> does anyone know, uh, or have any ideas as to who that might be? Would it be the church, the purified ministry? Carol says, the tr uh, would it be the church, the purified ministry? Rebecca types in... The Holy Ghost, question mark. Uh, can you think of any scriptures that tell us in a specific way who inherits? There is uh, one passage that actually goes into some detail showing who it is. And that passage is Ezekiel 16. It talks about Jerusalem the mother, as well as Jerusalem the daughter, and her two sisters, Samaria and Sodom. And as one reads that chapter, you know, you find out that it doesn't line up with the historical Samaria, Sodom, and uh, Jerusalem as far as the daughter is concerned. But you do see that Jerusalem, the mother, is certainly speaking of the Jews. And so you, all, you are all familiar with Doug's study on that, I'm sure. And what we find out there is that even though Jerusalem, the daughter, is under the greatest condemnation of anyone else there, that to Jerusalem, the daughter, is to be fulfilled the everlasting covenant. And so we'll see what that means. Okay, Jerusalem, the daughter, the everlasting covenant. And that's uh, in Ezekiel 16, uh, verse 44 says, <clears throat> Behold, everyone that useth Proverbs shall use this proverb against thee, saying, As is the mother, so is the daughter. So you have Jerusalem, the mother, Jerusalem, the daughter. And in verse 60 of the same chapter, Speaking to the daughter, it says, Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with thee in the days of thy youth. I will establish unto thee an everlasting covenant. Then thou shalt remember thy ways and be ashamed when thou shalt receive thy sisters, thine elder and thy younger, and I will give them unto thee for daughters. 
but not by my covenant. Thy covenant. Thy covenant, sorry. And I will establish my covenant with thee, and thou shalt know that I am Yahweh, that thou mayest remember and be confounded and never open thy mouth any more because of thy shame. And I am pacified toward thee for all that thou hast done, saith the Lord God. So you see here that to Ezekiel 16 is, uh, well, to uh, the daughter of Jerusalem in Ezekiel 16, is to be fulfilled the everlasting covenant. Especially, of course, uh, verse 60 makes that very clear. And there are other passages which give this same message. Uh, one that's very important is Isaiah 55 where it talks about the everlasting covenant and its establishment in the last days. So starting at verse 1, it says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that has no money, come ye, buy, and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which satisfieth not. Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people a leader and commander to the people. And it goes on. So this here uh, it helps us in one way. It lets us know, uh, as well as this psalm, that this David, who is clearly, of course, Isaiah lived after the time of the David of old. So it's clear that Isaiah is speaking of the antitypical David. And the those who receive the everlasting covenant, which according to Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all these other things that uh, we have been reading and will read, this covenant is to be established in the last days. So those who receive the everlasting covenant in the last days are spoken of here in Isaiah 55, and to them the everlasting covenant is called the sure mercies of David. In other words, those who receive the everlasting covenant and everlasting uh, those who uh, receive that everlasting covenant in the last days and antitypical David live at the same time and they have some sort of relation one to another. And in this psalm, David is uh, giving a message concerning her that inherits, which her that inherits is the same as her that receives the everlasting covenant. Because if the everlasting covenant is confirmed with them, of course they receive the inheritance. And I was, uh, did you have something to say, Mom? Oh, um, I just un I just unmuted in case you asked the question again, and you thought that might be. I was wondering if that might be the way she's been. Well, ultimately, it will end up being the wave sheath, but we know that the daughter of Jerusalem at first, is composed of more than just the wave sheaf because she's under condemnation. You know, the wave sheaf will be purified, right? So <clears throat> the wave sheaf is contained within the daughter of Jerusalem, and the daughter of Jerusalem will expand to being the wave sheaf, and those who <laughs> refuse to become part of the wave sheaf will be sifted out. Okay. But, um, yeah, I just... Um, the reason why I noticed that you came off mute is because I was getting some echo. And so, oh, um, oh, oh. yeah. I'm going back on mute. Okay, thanks. But feel free to come off again if you have anything to say, of course. All right, so there we had Isaiah 55 making this uh, same connection. And then we also have Isaiah 61. And we've discussed some of these passages in Isaiah before. Um, at least in the overview sense. And we learned that Isaiah 51, or sorry, Isaiah 61, uh, speaks of uh, David, just like Isaiah 55 does. 
And there he says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto me. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And actually, uh, in Psalm 4, remember how the message that David had to give is, you know, how long will you be heavy of heart in this year? So, the job that is appointed here in uh, Isaiah 61 is to give the garment of praise in place of the spirit of heaviness that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of Yahweh, that he might be glorified. Uh, trees, that's uh, similar to what we saw in Psalm chapter 1. So here we have this ministry here, which we've understood to be uh, the restoration and the ministry of the 1888 message, the message of justification by faith. Uh, especially as it develops into the 9T Reformation. And within this context, it begins talking about those who have their garments changed, those who become trees of righteousness, and how they build the old ways, and et cetera, et cetera, and how they will be the priests of the Lord, and they will be ministers of God, and they'll eat the riches of the Gentiles. And within this context, in verse 8, speaking of those people, it says, For I, the Lord, or I, Yahweh, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering. And I will direct their work in truth. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. So we can see here that this everlasting covenant is made, again, with those who partake in this same ministry. So this is, again, it's just confirming what we've understood in the past. Um, there are more passages which deal with this uh, everlasting covenant and connect it uh, with the ministry of David and the rest of that. Um, in Jeremiah, there's passages, Jeremiah 32 speaks of that. But we won't read all that right now. But we will read just one more. And it's Ezekiel 37, verses 24 to 26. And this is what it says. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. And they all shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. So you can see here that all these things are connected together, and we can see here that the one to receive the everlasting covenant is the daughter of Jerusalem, or Jerusalem the daughter. Now, the daughter of Jerusalem is also likened, or is also uh, equated with the daughter of Zion, and we can see that in a few places, and when we look at these passages, it will make it really clear to us that this daughter of Jerusalem, this daughter of Zion, is the one that will receive the inheritance. And uh, so we're going to look at a few passages. Uh, first, we're going to look at Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 14. It says, Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the heart. O daughter of Jerusalem. 
So you see it's calling this uh, same identity daughter of Zion and daughter of Jerusalem. Uh, this next one, which is very clear, is uh, Micah chapter 4, verse 8. It says, And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion. The kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. So you see here, the daughter of Jerusalem is the one to receive the kingdom. So this everlasting covenant is made with the daughter of Jerusalem, just like we saw in Ezekiel 16. And again, if you go back and check out Doug's study, um, Three Sisters and Their Mother, Ezekiel 16, it really starts from a broad perspective and really narrows it down to show that the identity of the daughter of Jerusalem is the branch. And, you know, the branch movement in particular. We had the Adventist movement, Samaria, the Davidian movement, Sodom, and the branch movement is the daughter of Jerusalem. So again, I want to cite everyone to that study. But there is another passage that I want to look at which will help clarify this because, you know, the daughter of Jerusalem in Ezekiel 16 is under so much condemnation. How is it that the daughter of Jerusalem will ever receive this everlasting covenant. And uh, another passage which talks about this is Isaiah chapter 62. And so, again, it's Isaiah 62 is all part of the same context of Isaiah 61, where it talks about that ministry. And Isaiah 62 continues on promising that the spirit of prophecy would remain in the church. Isaiah 62 starts off saying, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And um, in one of the timely greetings, Hoteth speaks of this, and how, you know, for God to say, I will not hold my peace, is for God to say that I will not stop talking. You know, I'm going to keep talking until the righteousness thereof of Zion and Jerusalem <clears throat> goes forth as brightness and the salvation thereof with the lamp that burneth. In other words, our Heavenly Family will keep giving these messages and will keep speaking through the spirit of prophecy for the purpose of bringing us to the point of receiving their righteousness and having that righteousness shine out as brightness, as a lamp that burns. And you know that it talks about how uh, this church receives the new name, which of course we know to be the name of the branch. And you know it goes on talking about how he said his watchmen and they won't keep silent. And it goes on with these promises that he will establish Jerusalem again. And then we come to a familiar passage in verse 10. And those who are familiar with Doug's studies and the seven thunders and even the uh, uh, dry bone study will be familiar with this verse. And actually, I'll read the verse before uh, just to have a little bit of the context. Actually, I'll read from verse 7. Uh, and give him no rest till he establish, and till he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord hath sworn by his right hand, and by the arm of his strength, surely I will no more give thy corn to be meat for thine enemies, and thy sons of, and the sons of stranger, of the stranger, shall not drink thy wine, for the which thou hast labored. But they have gathered they that have gathered it shall eat it and praise the Lord. And they that have brought it together shall drink it in, uh, in the courts of my holiness. And then this is what it says 
go through, go through the gates, prepare ye the way of the people. Cast up, cast up the highway, gather up the stones, lift up a standard for the people. Now, Doug, uh, in the Seventh Thunder study in particular, not the introduction, but the full-length study, goes into this in some detail, but he also made mention of it in other studies, I believe the Bible and study he did as well. And he explained how this is describing uh, the preparation for the kingdom to be established, and how it's showing this progressive uh, reformation, same as we see in the dry bones. And so, go through is a description of the work of the first part of what brings this uh, reformation. And we know that what has been bringing this reformation has been the messages that have come ever since the first angel's message. So, go through is a representation of the first angel's message. Go through the gates. The second angel's message, of course, gates representing churches, and uh, the second angel's message was proclaimed throughout the churches. Prepare ye the way of the people is the work of the third angel's message, all about laying down the foundation and preparing the way. Cast up was a uh, description of the work that Hodaf did under the rod message. Cast up the highway was a description of the work under Ben Roden, the branch he gather of the stones was a description of the work under Lois Roden, and lift up a standard for the people is a description of the work of the message that Doug brought. Now, I will, you know, I believe that you've all studied this before, so I'm not going to go into the detail of explaining why that is what it is. But again, you can see the studies if you want to look more into it and anyone who may be listening to this later who hasn't studied you know you can see the studies on uh online at the branch dot org you can see the dry bones extra study now what takes place after this is very interesting so you see all these things take place in verse 10 and then what follows it says behold the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, which Hodaf says means that it's very definite that this is referring to the last days. Say ye to the daughter of Zion, who we just found out who that is, behold thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And they shall uh, call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. Going from downtrodden and forsaken to being redeemed and holy. Thy salvation cometh. You know, that's the message that we have today. And it's the message that's being proclaimed to those in the branch. It's being proclaimed to the daughter of Zion. And... Here it's showing that the daughter of Zion is going to have the reward. And the daughter of Zion receives salvation. And the daughter of Zion will be the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And they will not be forsaken. You know, this is all showing that they receive the inheritance of the everlasting covenant. So this psalm then, it's for the end. And it's a psalm of David, so it's the David in the end, the antithetical David, that has a message for or concerning her that inherits, which is the daughter of Zion, the daughter of Jerusalem, the branch movement, as pointed out in Ezekiel 16. To be more specific, this could only be given at a time where all those things are in place. The time of the end has to be in place. There has to be a such thing as the daughter of Zion, the branch movement. And there also has to be such an individual as David. Which shows that if all those things are identified, if all those things are in place, then we know that it really narrows down the time to which 
this applies. In other words, it could not have been an application before there was the time of the end. You know, this could not have been present truth before the time of the end. It could not have been present truth before her that inherits exists, before the daughter of Jerusalem exists. And it could not have been present truth before David exists. In other words, we should understand that this is a message which is for us at this time. Is that clear to everyone? That what's contained in this song must be a message of present truth for us at this time. Amen. Yes, okay, good. Amen. So, that's important to have established uh, from the beginning, and it will become all the more clear as we go. So, and the other, the other thing, too, to keep in mind is that if this psalm is actually being revealed at this time, that's just another indication that it is for this very time. So David starts out crying out to Yahweh, saying, Listen to my word, Yahweh. Consider my sighing, groaning cry. Now this is a lamentful cry. The word there for sighing or groaning in Hebrew is really a lamenting thing, and it only occurs uh, two times in Scripture, uh, here and in Psalm 39. And Psalm 39 is actually a cry of David um, concerning his own sins and crying out for deliverance. And it starts off uh, with him being mute, or he has received something to say, but he, he's not permitted to say it, or he uh, can't say, you know, it's, he says in it that he is made um, unable to speak because of Yahweh. In other words, Yahweh told him not to speak. And then, when he did tell uh, him to speak, he caused David to cry out for deliverance from his sin. And as he did that, he used this word, it's in verse 3 of Psalm 9, and it's translated in the King James as musing, but it's actually sighing or groaning or lamenting. And he's lamenting over his own sins and crying out for deliverance. Which again, that's another thing showing us the same thing that we saw in Psalm 4, how when David would uh, finally speak or open his lips, in other words, uh, at the same time where he would proclaim the message that was given to him, he would also receive the deliverance from his sins. That was in Psalm 4. And so Psalm 39 shows the same thing. We're not going to get into it now, but I wanted to mention it because what it shows is that this word, there are other words for sighing and for groaning and for lamenting. But this word, David, he wrote both of these psalms, Psalm 39 and Psalm 5. And in Psalm 39, he's lamenting over his own condition and crying out for deliverance from his sins, uh, which he receives. Here, he's making that same type of cry. But this time, it's concerning her that inherits. This time, it's concerning the daughter of Jerusalem. So he says, listen to my words, Yahweh. Cons uh, consider my sighing cry, or my groaning cry, or my lamentful cry. So something is wrong concerning the daughter of Zion. And he says, pay attention to the sound of my cry for help, my king and my goddess. I am interceding to you. Or, I intercede to you. It's, they mean basically the same thing, but you could translate it. I am interceding or I intercede. And basically what's happening, and we discussed this uh, last Friday night as well when we went through Psalm 4, how there is a difference between 
the prayer of the righteous and the prayer of the wicked, you know, the prayer of righteous not avails much, and how when someone is born again, and this goes for anyone who's born again, we sit in heavenly places with Christ and become part of that council, the council of the gods. And Christ is representing us in that council, and we can make our petitions and our voices heard in the council. Pay attention to the sound of my cry for help, my king and my goddess. I am interceding to you. And uh, the word that's used there for interceding is something that is usually, I mean, when that is used, it's almost all the time, if not all the time, used for someone interceding on behalf of God's people. You know, and that's the context of this anyways. And it's, in other words, you know, David is crying out for the deliverance of the daughter of Zion, for the salvation of her that inherits. And is really crying, you know, uh, earnestly saying, you know, pay attention to the sound of my cry for help. Like, notice that I'm in distress. You have promised to answer me, my king and my goddess, you know, both of our intercessors, branch he and branch she. You have promised to hear my cry. I'm crying out to you earnestly, and I'm interceding to you. And it's that's what is happening here. And verse 3 continues on the same thought saying, Yahweh, in the morning I will hear, or you will hear my voice. In the morning I will go up before you and look upon you, or look to you, look at you. It's, you know, morning, the morning time of prayer is also a time of intercession. So that's what's happening here in those other Psalms. Psalm 59, verse 16. And Psalm 88, verse 13, also portray the morning, you know, obviously it's times of prayer, which we're familiar with already here in the branch. And um, so what's happening here is that there is something going wrong. He's crying for help on behalf of the daughter of Zion. So what this should let us know is that now, here at this time, it's pointing out, as always, the dry bones. It's showing the dry bones condition, although it's being very specific to those in the branch movement who hear a message from David. And there's something that is going on that is not good. In other words, crying out for help, crying out for deliverance, it's showing that we are under attack by the principalities and powers. You know, and this is what the scriptures say, and this is what I see in reality. You know, the wicked gods, the enemies, are attacking this movement and this, you know, everyone connected with it who wants to investigate it. You know, and I'm sure you all can look and see whatever's happening in your own life to see the same thing, how things are being brought against us to try and uh, bring this whole thing to fail. And it only makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, consider the message that we receive. Consider what the scriptures declare concerning the message which we have received. You know, looking at the message itself, we see that it's the message of life. The message pointing us to our Heavenly Family and showing us their love more clearly than before so that we can receive life from them, so we can be saved from our sins. It's the vitalized gospel. It's the gospel restored. You know, this is what was pointed out in the types of the Maccabees, the Maccabean typology, how the gospel was devitalized and the antitypical ceremonial system was removed from the church. But now it has been restored. 
You know, this is the vitalized gospel. So clearly, I mean, this has not happened for a long time. Right? I mean, if the dry bones have started to be resurrected, which the scriptures declare that they have, of course the devil is going to fight this, especially when we understand that the kingdom comes to the daughter of Zion and that the kingdom is established in the wilderness and that the kingdom is established by justification by faith, right? Because when we receive the life of Christ and we die to self, and we put away the ways of the wicked gods. We are no longer servants to Satan and the wicked gods, but we are a servant, or we, we become servants of our heavenly family. We become part of their kingdom. They become our lords, our masters, our king and queen. And this is why David is crying out, my king and my goddess, you know, because the experience that he's had has been that of renouncing the wicked gods and others are also experiencing the same thing. And because of that, there is a war being waged because this kingdom, which the wicked gods have ever wanted to suppress, is now being brought into being. And so when, when there are things that happen... <laughs> To each one of you, that just seems like the whole world is against you, <laughs> you know, it's just because the wicked gods want to do everything possible to keep each one here from receiving light and also from moving uh, on to proclaim the message of light. Lorna just typed in. Sister White describes it as pressed as a cart beneath sheaves. That's a fair explanation. Yeah, it's, you know, there is an attack going on here. <clears throat> and there is need for intercession. And as we looked at when we studied Psalm 4, for so long there's been no intercessor, you know, other than our Heavenly Father. But they've been looking among the children of men to find anyone to uh, take part in this intercession, you know, intercessory prayer, and they haven't been able to find anyone who can join them as being part of the Heavenly Council to intercede in that matter. And now they have, and not just one person either, you know. It may start with one, but it expands beyond that. And that's that's what's happening, and that's why there's such a warfare coming against this movement. So I just want to pray, and I do pray every day, but I want to ask you guys to pray that each one of you will be kept from being destroyed by this. You know, Carol typed in as a grain of mustard. That's how the kingdom starts, indeed. And so, being so small, it might seem easy to crush, you know. <laughs> and that's what is being attempted by the principalities and powers of darkness. But, righteousness will stand. And that I'm confident of. And that is something that we should all be confident of. And so, let's trust in our Heavenly Family to bring that about. Now, I also want to point out uh, something else in regards to verse 3 here, how, you know, Yahweh, in the morning, you will hear my voice. So that's interceding at a time of prayer. In the morning, I will go up before you and look at you or look upon you. And that's, you know, as if to intercede, you know, just like, you know, Christ goes and stands before the Father. To make intercession. So it's all intercessory language. Um and times of prayer, but we also know that the morning is a time of deliverance. And um, either in a general sense, or there's other uh, references referring to the morning being the break of day of the kingdom being established. In other words, the first deliverance. 
And this is kind of echoed as we continue on. There's more reference to a time of uh, deliverance from an outward foe. So we'll continue on with that. So David, we're seeing this problem in verse 4 as he's interceding. He says, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. You do not dwell with evil. So here is David, and this is concerning her that inherits. In Ezekiel 37, when it was talking about uh, the reception of the everlasting covenant, Yahweh said, I will dwell among you. And the first dominion is restored to the daughter of Zion. And that includes Yahweh dwelling among us. You know, there's all these passages, all these promises and these prophecies that David is aware of, that Yahweh will dwell in the midst of the daughter of Zion and in Jerusalem. But here he says, for you are not a God who delights in wickedness. You do not dwell with evil. So there's recognized here that there is a disconnect between the current reality of the daughter of Zion and the promised future. And by the fact that there's this disconnect, there is an evident need for something. And what that evident need is, is the purification from sin. And so this is, you know, it's really uh, showing how because of this, because Yahweh cannot dwell with evil, and because Yahweh will dwell with us, we must be purified from all evil that we may have. And it, uh I just want to mention as well, Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 1, talking about wisdom, shows that, you know, anyone who grasps hold of wickedness refuses our sister, refuses wisdom, and pushes her back. And she has to withdraw when someone chooses wickedness, when someone makes a covenant with death. So here it shows that there's a need for washing away of sins, for purification, and that God will not dwell with those who continue on. And this, you know, in these psalms, I want to read another quick psalm here that uh, refers to the same idea. Verse, uh, it's actually a Psalm chapter 15. Or Psalm 15. It's the Psalm of David. It says, Yahweh, who will abide in your tabernacle? Who will dwell in your holy hill? Answer, he that walks uprightly and works righteousness and uh, speaks the truth in his heart. He that backbites not with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor nor takes up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honors them that fear the Lord. He that swears to his own hurt and changes not. He that puts not out his own or puts not out his money to usury, nor takes reward against the innocent. He that does these things shall never be moved. In other words, it's showing that it's he that he that will dwell in the hill of God is he that will be purified, you know, justified. And to be justified means that our sins will be taken away and we will live a holy life. Right? We'll live a life without sin. And so it's um that's what is found in uh, Psalm chapter 15, and that's what's happening here, that, okay, well, it, we're promised to dwell with God, but if there's sin, it's not going to happen. So, if we do all these all these things in Psalm 15, which is, of course, by receiving life, then 
we will be able to uh, have Yahweh dwell in our midst like never before. You know, we'll see the fulfillment of the everlasting covenant to us, which the everlasting covenant, again, is that change of heart. So if we accept that, then we will receive the inheritance. The kingdom will be fully established. So that's Psalm 15. Uh, moving on now to verse 5, it says, The ones boasting shall not station themselves before your eyes. You hate or shun all doers of lawlessness. Now here, there is a double application that ends up uh, wrapping together into one. In reality, it's a very broad application, but it has more than one aspect, and we want to focus on it. First of all, this uh, psalm is concerning her that inherits. So evidently, there are boastful ones uh, who want to stand up before the eyes of Yahweh among you know, the daughter of Zion. Uh, Carol typed in a question. Uh, she says, is it, you know, this, is the everlasting covenant the same as the blessing of Abraham? And yes, it is. That's where the first mention of the everlasting covenant is in the scriptures. And then there's a number of references uh, beyond that, which we looked at some of them when we were identifying her that inherits. But yeah, it's definitely the same thing, although in a far fuller sense than uh, Abraham ever received it. But what we see here in Psalm 5, verse 5, is that as it applies to the church, you know, there are those who stand. It talks about in Psalm 1 how the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. And here it's saying that the ones who are boasting will not stand before your eyes. And this is David speaking to Yahweh, you know, so before the eyes of the Lord. And of course, eyes, as we know from the messages that we've received, you know, Hod have talked about this and so did Ben Roden, have the eyes of the Lord are a symbol of his prophets. First Samuel 9.9 9 talks about how he that was in the former times called a seer is now called prophet. And so, what does it mean that the boastful ones or the ones boasting will not station themselves before your eyes? Well, again, it has multiple applications. First, it applies to the church with those who are proud, those who have boasting, which, to be, you know, I'm sure you can all see the connection between pride and self-righteousness, right? The fact of the matter is, everyone in a dry bones condition has self-righteousness. You know, dry bones is the same as being Laodicean. And a Laodicean is naked. The only skin that they have is their own skin, which Hodder says is a symbol of self-righteousness. So the only clothing that they have is their own skin. So what this, what this shows is that there are those who are proud among us. And don't look to others. You know, each person here is to look upon themselves and examine yourselves just like it's called for us to do in Psalm 4. And it's saying that we will not stand before the eyes of Yahweh. You know, obviously, the implication is that the boasting ones will attempt to stand, but that they won't. And the reason why is because through the messages that come through the prophets, in other words, the inspired truth that we are receiving, our pride will not be able to stand up. It'll either have to be cut down and we will no longer be proud, we'll no longer be boasting ones or boastful ones, we will be humbled, or we will end up separating ourselves. So again, we'll not station themselves before your eyes. The other aspect of this, uh, we'll see as we continue on, goes broader than just the experience within her that inherits. 
but it's something that affects her that inherits. And what this is, is that the language that's used here, the ones boasting, stationing themselves, in Psalm 2, verse 2, I'll read verses 1 and 2 actually, it says, Why do the heathen rage or make commotion, and the people meditate on a vain thing? They, the kings of the earth, are stationing themselves, and the rulers are taking counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed. And this, you know, we studied uh, a few months back, so we won't go into all of what it means here in Psalm 2, but what we see is that the rulers and the kings of the earth, what we saw in context when we studied this last time, is that this is particularly referring to the Assyrian. And notice that it says that the Assyrian, or the kings of the earth, are stationing themselves. That's the same word that's used here. The Assyrian is also definitely a boastful one. You know, the Assyrians are boasting. This is what is uh, recorded in Isaiah chapter 10, verse uh, 12. It says, Wherefore, it shall come to pass that when Yahweh has performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart or the proud heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. For he saith, by the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent, and I have removed the bounds of the people and have robbed their treasures. And I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man, and my hand hath performed, or hath uh, formed as a nest, <clears throat> or found as a nest, the riches of the people, and as one gathers eggs that are left, have I gathered all the earth, and there was none that moved the wing, or opened the mouth, or peeped. Shall the axe boast itself against him that doeth therewith, or shall the saw magnify itself against him that takes it? as if the rod should shake itself against him that lift it up, or as the staff should lift up itself as if it were no wood. So you see here that the king of Assyria is very proud and is boasting. And this is uh, what's happening here, where the same language is being paralleled in Psalm 5, verse 5, with Psalm 2, verse 2. So there's this application to the Assyrians as well, who are boastful and mostly the king of Assyria and the rulers of the earth, the, the ruling class of the Assyrians. And it says that they shall not stand before your eyes. And this is David saying this. And this has a few uh, aspects to it as well. But one is that when the morning breaks at first deliverance, the Assyrian will be caused to flee from the land, and they won't be able to station themselves any longer because the deliverance is at hand. And what happens at the deliverance? Anyone? What happens at the deliverance, at the voice of God? We're delivered from all outward and inward foes. Delivered from all outward and inward foes. That's definitely the experience as far as the inward foe, that's when the 140,000 receive that deliverance. What else happens that causes the Assyrian to flee? The ensign is set up. The ensign is set up. And what does that consist of? The kingdom being established. The kingdom being established. So what really dramatic event takes place at that time? The second exodus. The second exodus. Okay. What other really dramatic event takes place at that time that might have some sort of connection to the eyes of the Lord? Okay, what are the eyes of the Lord? The prophets. The prophets. Okay, so what very significant event that might have to do with the eyes of the Lord takes place at the time of the first deliverance? The ark is the discovered. Ark. Pardon? The ark is discovered. 
Uh, that's not specifically what's being referred to. Doug wrote a whole book about this recently. It was his. It was a long book that he wrote. The four carpenters. The four carpenters. <clears throat> Thank you. There's the special resurrection, right, where these mm-hmm. prophets are resurrected. Oh, I was not getting one. Yeah, I know. I was like, hmm, come on, people, you can get it. <laughs> yeah. No, my mind was not there at all. Yeah, so there's there's a deliverance, right, when the morning breaks, and those who are boasting and stationing themselves, like we see in Psalm 2, will not stand, will not be able to station themselves before the eyes of the Lord, before his eyes, Yahweh's eyes, his prophets. The prophets are resurrected. The four carpenters and very well likely other prophets as well. And so there it's, you know, we have we have this scenario uh, taking place. But how do these two applications kind of tie together? Because it's like, okay, so one's boasting uh, shall not station themselves before your eyes. We've seen that that has application to the daughter of Zion, the church, but then we also see that the language is very similar to what is spoken of concerning the Assyrian in Psalm 2 in connection with Isaiah 10. So is it just two different things and it's either one or the other, or does this come together into one picture? And so they're tied together in this thought. It is because of the wickedness of those in the daughter of Zion, or the wickedness of the daughter of Zion, the wickedness of those, you know, because of uh, those of us who have not received life, either clinging to sin in one way or not receiving life, because of that, what the Assyrian does will uh, cause us to suffer all the more if we remain in our sins. In other words, if we if we remain in our sins, if we remain in our wickedness, when the Assyrian starts causing us trouble, it's going to be a lot worse. And just, you know, there is definitely specific references to the Assyrian coming against the daughter of Zion. And Isaiah 10.32 says, As yet shall he remain at Nob that day, he shall shake his hand against the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. So the Assyrian will definitely come against the branch movement. There's no question about it. And Isaiah 52, verses 1 to 8, shows the same thing, but in a different sort of way. We won't get all into it right now. Um, But there's the message to awake and shake ourselves from the dust, and that's the mes- a message that comes to the captive daughter of Zion. In other words, the captive of uh, the daughter of Zion will yet away from the land of our fathers. And it talks about being oppressed by the Assyrian and how, you know, we would be caused to howl. And then there's the message of how beautiful upon the mountains of Edipin that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace and bringeth good tidings of good, and publishes salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigns. Thy God reigns. In other words, the kingdom is being established. And, you know, that message, it's it's all from how there is uh, a time where the Assyrian will be coming against the daughter of Zion. And we learn from Isaiah 2 that the Assyrian is already stationing himself against Yahweh and against his anointed, which is David. And so by extension, it comes against the whole movement. But here's the thing. So here's, I want to try and tie this thought together for verse 5 a little more clearly to kind of recap before we move on. So it is because of the wickedness of the daughter of Zion that there will be unnecessary uh, suffering at the hands of the Assyrian. We know that the Assyrian is already against Yahweh and David from Psalm 2 and is by implication or indirectly against the daughter of Zion as well. 
and will be even more directly against the God of Zion in the future, which is what Isaiah 10, verse 32 says. So the Assyrian leaders won't be able to stand before the prophets because their plans will not succeed, and that is fully manifested at the first deliverance. But this is also spoken of in chapter 5, or Psalm 5, verse 10, where it says, Judge them, O gods, let them fall by their own counsel, their own plan. Drive them away because of their many transgressions, for they rebelled against you. So we see here that there's this uh, showing that their plan will not succeed. Their own way will be turned upon their head, which is kind of what the Assyrian was saying in uh, Isaiah 10, 12 to 15, saying, you know, shall the axe turn against him that wields it? You know, I'm the one wielding this tool. Shall it turn against me? Well, the answer from Yahweh is yes, it will. And that's what it's saying in Psalm 5. So that's part of that's The Assyrian won't be able to stand before the prophets because their plans won't succeed, and also because of the first deliverance, the prophets will rise, and the Assyrian will be afraid, caused to flee. And those boasting in the church, in the daughter of Zion, won't stand before the prophets either, because the message is so cutting and severe. Either our pride will be knocked down and we'll have to be humble, or we'll end up separating ourselves uh, from the message. So it really applies to any within Assyria or within Daughter of Zion. And this is summed up saying at the end of verse 5, saying to Yahweh, you hate or you shun all doers of lawlessness. And it's, you know, uselessness or, you know, vain things or lawless things. So anyone, whether the Assyrian or whether those, you know, a lot of times we could think of the Assyrian being bad. Oh, yeah, you know, the governments of this church or the governments of this uh, this system of the Assyrian, we look upon as so evil because, you know, we hear these things about, you know, the Illuminati and Freemasonry and child sacrifice and, you know, all this crazy, um, you know, satanic ritual worship that goes on, along with just the other wickedness that is done by the Assyrian even today. And we know that it's going to get all the worse. But here what's happening is that the Assyrian and the wicked, even in this very movement, are being bunched together. And it's being said, hey, all who do lawlessness will suffer the same fate. You know, all of us, there's no respect of persons. You know, there's no respect of persons. We need to be wholly converted to our heavenly family. We need to be set free from sin. And, it, you know, it goes on in verse 6, saying... Again, still David speaking to Yahweh, you will destroy all who speak falsehood. So we see that the ultimate result here, the end result of this is actually destruction of the wicked. And this is, of course, what Hadith referred to, uh, what his message focused on in a large degree, other than the kingdom being established. And so we, this, isn't, this aspect isn't anything new to us. It starts with, you know, okay, we need to be purified from sin. There's a need of being purified. There's a need of purification. And there's a call to receive that purification. But the end result is that there will be some who won't receive it. And the result for them will be their own destruction. So Yahweh is repulsed by the man of bloods and deceit, is what it says. And it's, that is a very strong word. The word there in Hebrew and in Greek is just how repulsed Yahweh is. It's hard to really express. But it's something that we need to take seriously. We need to recognize that here what it's doing, it's easy for us to look at those ruling the Assyrian world and say, hey, that's clearly, you know, they're clearly guilty of blood and deceit. 
But it was just going through showing how Yahweh will destroy all who speak falsehood and all who are doers of all this will be found. And Yahweh is repulsed by the man of blood and deceit. In other words, violence, cruelty, deceit. It ultimately gets down to a lack of love and speaking falsehood, whether to others or to ourselves, whether we're self-deceived or deceiving others, you know? And it is a very, um, you know, it's strong language that you see here, something that is designed to shake us up. You know, it's written like this for a reason, and the message is given so straightforwardly, because we need to see the true sinfulness of sin. Carol says, we all have murder in our hearts when we don't have Christ's righteousness. And that is so true. You know, isn't, doesn't it say in the wisdom of Solomon that when we push back our sister, we make a covenant with death? You know, how terrible is that? And this gets, it paints an image for us uh, in a couple of verses down, which is quite dramatic as to what that is. You know, it, it shows us the terrible nature of what it is to be unconverted and how wicked it really is. And so we'll see that in a couple of verses. But David continues on here in verse 7. And he says, But as for me, in the multitude of your mercy, I will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in fear of you. You know, rather than fearing the Assyrian and rather than fearing the wicked gods who are bringing so much against this movement, David says, I'm going to fear you rather than them. I'm going to worship, bow down and worship towards your holy temple and I'll enter into your house. So it's, again, like we've seen in some of these other psalms where David is pointing out wickedness and then he draws distinction and is determined to choose not to be part of that. And so all who take part of the sure mercies of David, all who receive the new heart that David spoke of in Psalm 51, all who pray the same prayer will be able to say the same thing. You know, David says it in this passage, but anyone who decides to take that same stand and to choose our Heavenly Family and to receive new life from them, we'll be able to say the same thing. But as for me, in the multitude of your mercy, I will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in fear of you. In other words, you know, in Psalm 15, it says, who will enter into your tabernacle and will, you know, enter into your house? It says, he that walks uprightly, he that does all this, and it's righteousness. So, in order to enter into his house, we need to receive their righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. And I will bow down toward your holy temple in fear of you. That's, again, this idea of uh, worshiping and interceding. So we, and also in uh, tying that together again with Psalm 15, entering into the tabernacle. That's what happens when we enter into heavenly places in Christ, like it says in Ephesians 2. That is a reference to becoming part of the heavenly council, you know, by being born again. And so here it's, you're entering into the tabernacle, you're becoming part of the ministry, becoming ministers of the Most High God, you know, priests, just like I said in, uh, Isaiah 61. These things are all saying the same thing, just explaining it in different ways. And so, everyone's invited to say, but ask for me, in the multitude of the mercy, I will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in fear of you. Amen. Amen. And so, David says, in view of all this, Yahweh Lead me in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make straight before me your way. 
In other words, David, even though he's undergone an experience, and even though he worships and uh, towards the temple of Yahweh and intercedes on behalf of the daughter Zion, David needs guidance from Yahweh and needs to be led in righteousness because of his enemies. And the reason for that is uh, multiple, you know, it's a multifaceted reason. The enemies in one sense is anyone in the dominion of the wicked gods. Anyone who's serving wicked gods, whether willfully or unwillfully, is working against the purposes of our heavenly family. And is therefore, just like the Assyrian, stationing themselves against Yahweh and against his anointed. You know, and that's whether someone is the Assyrian or whether they're part of the daughter of Zion. Anyone who's worshiping or is uh, part of the system of the wicked gods, in other words, dry bones, is actually, this is what Christ said, either you are for me or you're against me. You know, so we need to realize if we are not converted, if we have not received life, if we have not taken part in the sure mercies of David, we are working against Yahweh and his anointed and against this movement. And that's a scary thought, you know, and I hope that it's taken very seriously. But it doesn't have to be that way, you know. And the reason why David's asking for guidance, he said, lead me in your righteousness because of my enemies, is because only in doing the righteousness of Yahweh can the enemies be turned from being enemies to being friends. You know, it is wisdom, according to Wisdom of Solomon, it is wisdom who makes a person a friend of God and of prophets. So if we want to turn back from being enemies, we need to turn to wisdom and we need to rece receive her and the life which she gives and then we'll be friends of God and of prophets. So David says, make straight before me your way. In other words, guide me and lead me to do everything possible that can be done in order for those in the daughter of Zion to receive life. Because if those in the daughter of Zion receive life and we become a purified wave sheep, the Assyrian isn't going to be able to do much. But if we put it off for long, I fear of what is going to happen. So Heavenly Family, be with us. Please guide me and guide us. And we trust that you're doing everything that you can. Verse 9 is portraying the honest truth of what it is to be dead in trespasses and sins. And this applies, again, more directly, this psalm is about her that inherits. It's about the daughter of Zion, and it extends to anyone else who's lawless. For in their mouth, there is no truth or firmness or reliability is the other, the other way that that could be translated. In their mouth. Their inward part or their inward self or deep within them, you know, it is futile. Their inward part is futile. Futile means unable to produce anything good. You can try and you can try and you can try and you can try, but you will not produce anything good. That's what we've been learning, right? We can't perform righteousness when we haven't received the righteousness of Christ. Right? We have futility within ourselves. But it's not just futility. It's injurious. Like, the word there that's used, the meaning of it is so much more broad 
than we have in the English word. It's futility, but it's injurious. And the picture it paints, we'll see as we get the whole picture, is very almost grotesque. You know, this futility within ourselves, but it's injurious to ourselves and to others, which is expanded upon in the next part. It says, their throat is an open grave. You know, totally dead inside. Their throat is an open grave. Their tongue is smooth, is one way to translate it, or their tongue is a slippery slope. The picture that it paints is that it's like someone, the way that this is uh, painting the picture is someone there with their mouth open and their tongue out and just death pouring out of them. You know, just, it's the their throat being an open grave and their inward part being injurious and futile. And the words that are used there, like that futile injurious word, it's also could be translated as calamity and destruction and um, corruption. And it, the picture that it paints is like a grave that has been open with rotting flesh inside, causing injury to any who near it because of the stench. It's very grotesque the way, like how the picture that is being painted. And what does it mean? You know, the picture is that the inner self is futile and injurious. Of course, it's all within oneself. Their throat is an open grave and their tongue is a smooth, slippery slope. In other words, by going with the words that are spoken and by by someone in this condition, which is anyone in dry bones speaking to another, it's only imparting death. You know, death imparts death, and it cannot impart life. And the picture that it gives by saying that the tongue is smooth or is a slippery slope is that by someone speaking their unloving words to someone else, they're causing them to slide right down into their very own open grave. You know, one translation I read even uh, says their tongue is a slippery slope leading down into it, leading down into the grave. So it's an open mouth. And what it's saying is that we are causing harm to each other if we continue on in our sins. It's already pointed out that those other sins, whether they're part of the daughter of Zion or part of the um, Assyrian, are acting as enemies, they're acting like enemies to Yahweh and to David. And it's like we are spreading death and we ourselves are, we ourselves are experiencing such terrible death. But we're called not to do this anymore. You know, we're called to life. We're called to a new way. And showing this condition, I hope that it shows us that we have to die to self and receive a new life. You know, we have to die to self and receive a totally new life. If we think that we're going to progressively just get a little better and a little better, man, how bad of a picture that this song paints it's going to take us longer than our own life, that's for sure. You know, so praise our Heavenly Family that they just give us their righteousness, that they take it all away. You know, it's so beautiful. But there are those who will not accept that. And to them, you know, there will be the fate which they choose. And verse 10 continues on saying, Judge them, O gods, O Elohim. Let them fall by their own counsel or by their own plan. And that again 
echoes some of the things that we read about the Assyrian. But it's all those. All all who are dry bones have the same fate and have the same righteousness, which is no righteousness at all other than both ways. Drive them away because of their many transgressions, for they rebelled against you. So let us not rebel. And the next verse encourages us. And all those who take refuge in you. So wait, it's not everyone that is going to end up being driven away, right? It's not everyone who's going to fall by their own devices. It's not everyone who's going to continue to rebel and continue to be dead and spread death. Because there are those who take refuge. And it says, and all those who take refuge in you will rejoice forever. They will shout for joy. And I love it. The word that's there in the Septuagint, where it says shout for joy, it means they will be extremely joyful. Like it's, it's so emphatic. They will be extremely joyful. Forever they will shout for joy. And you, Yahweh, will dwell among them. And all who love your name will exalt in you. Yahweh's name is his character. Yahweh's name is also the Shekinah, Hashem, our sister. You know? If we seek her, we will have life, for she is a true life. And all they that hate her love death. We're either in or we're out. All those who take refuge in you will rejoice. So all of us have the choice. We can take refuge in our heavenly family and we will rejoice. And forever we will shout for joy because we will be receiving this everlasting covenant. So we will forever, you know, we have lived our lives. Let's just put things in perspective. You know, we have lived our lives so far. And ultimately, they are so short. Our lives are so short. When you think of the length of eternity, you know. So really, we haven't been dry bones for too long. We haven't been. There is a way out. And what we have now, man, we will, the life that we will have, if we accept their life, man, it is going to go on for forever. And even one second of that life is worth exchanging this death for. But we have the blessing to be able to endorse forever and rejoice exceedingly at that and Yahweh will dwell among us. You know, it says Yahweh will dwell among them and all who love your name will exult in you. You know, it's it ends with hope. For you bless the righteous, Yahweh, as a shield of approval or favor you crown us. So, awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise and Sit down, sit down upon the thrones and receive the crown. O Jerusalem, loose yourself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. We're called to receive our heavenly family's life and their righteousness, you know. How long 
will you go on in heaviness of heart and in slowness of heart? How long will you love falsehood and seek and seek in vanity? You know, let's turn to our heavenly family. They've called us to, and they are here to give life. The dry bones are being raised, and the devil is just warring against us to keep us dead. And let's refuse that. Let's recognize that the, everything that the devil says to us to try and keep us in a dead condition is a lie. And if it's a lie, it has no part in reality. Let's remember that. It's a lie, and if it's a lie, we have a choice of whether or not we're going to receive it and believe it. So let's choose to say, Satan, Yahweh rebukes you. Yahweh rebukes you. There is a righteous claim to his righteousness. You know, there's a just claim to the law, to obedience to the law, to righteousness. We can claim the very righteousness of God, and it's just to do so. So let's claim it. <laughs> and, you know, Psalm 4 showed us that the message that is to give us life is here, and it's been here for the past 11 months. So how much longer will we go on? Let's receive it today, and let's inherit, you know, let's receive that everlasting covenant, and let's go and be those priests of the Most High God. Amen. Mm -hmm and take this message of salvation to Assyria. Because there needs to be repentance, you know? And there's a lot of people out there who want to know the truth and need to hear it and will receive it. So anyways. Amen. Yeah, anyone who has anything to say Feel free to say it, and then uh, we'll close with prayer. As we come up to this Passover, it's coming on me stronger and stronger that I want a repentance message. I want a revival message. I want a personal work done at Passover this year. <laughs> Not 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 just doctrine, not a whole bunch of talking and convincing. I want that personal relational honesty. Amen, totally. All right. Well I'm I I really look forward to seeing, you know, where things will be going because I know I can see our heavenly family, you know, just as as much as the wicked gods are doing everything that they can, I know that our heavenly family is working so hard and that they are more mighty and more powerful than any of these wicked gods and that their plan will prevail. I'm confident of that. What my worry is, my concern, is for those who won't give up to them, you know? And I hope and pray that every one of you will give up to them, you know? It's, I've, I really do love you all. <laughs> and I can tell that everyone here loves each other, you know? And if we really do love each other, if we really do love each other, we will have to give up self for the sake of the other, you know. So Heavenly Family, I just ask you to gift each one here with an intense love for one another. Let's just, yeah, let's talk to our Heavenly Family and then we'll close off. Heavenly Family, For so long, we have lived our lives as an open grave, emitting nothing but death. And we haven't even realized how bad it's been. In fact, we've been boastful 
we've been proud, even if it's just to ourselves within our own minds. But your way is so much better. Your way is so, so much better. And I can't deny that your kingdom is being established and that your righteousness is spreading throughout this earth. You know, and yeah, it's starting very small and it may be growing slow at first, but I am confident, Heavenly Father, that your work will be accomplished and that there will be those who will receive you and your righteousness. And it breaks my heart to see how horrible you are over this. So I want to ask you to consider what I'm asking. And I know that this will be heard before the heavenly council. I just want to ask that this cry is heard and that father, mother, Your son still has wounds. And it is needless for this to go on. And you know it better than I do. You know it better than anyone else does. So if there's any way where these wicked gods could be just taken away from attacking these people for long enough, sister, for you to be able to just go and visit each one and plead and plead and plead till the point where either they break and accept you or where to the point where they just... end up having to choose, you know, either either the right decision or the wrong decision. Just to bring them to a point of decision, I want to ask that you do that. And again, you know, I know that you're merciful and each one, however long it takes for them to be brought to the right decision, that's what I'm asking for. Thank you so much, Heavenly Family. Thank you for doing me. Thank you for doing everything. Your intercession is so far beyond any type of prayer that I can pray. You know, I can only ask that a way be made. But you're the one who actually makes the way. And you're the one who brings salvation. So I thank you so much for doing so. Thank you, sister, for letting us know what you want us to be considering right now. Thank you so much, Heavenly Family. Thank you, Father and Mother, for sending wisdom and for sending the Word. And it's in their name that we ask everything here in the name of the branch and by His blood. Thank you. Amen. Mm-hmm.